Mr. Balan. Oh, for like five seconds. Ah. Oh. There's betrayal, and then there's this. Is a little cottage right on the water in Maryland called Cottage 506. It's a rustic place with a wood fire stove, a couple of small beds, and a small sitting area for breakfast. And then outside the cottage on the porch, you have this amazing view of the water. And then behind the cottage is the resort that the cottage is a part of. And the resort offers guests that stay in this cottage great food, great entertainment. I mean, this is a great spot. However, Cottage 506 has a dark secret. And it's the reason I and many other people will never good every weekend crazy murder mystery murder i'm guessing murder is gonna happen there, yeah a little afternoon on valentine's day 1998 a married couple named steve and kim rico held hands as they walked towards their car they had just dropped their eight-year-old daughter off at a neighbor's house in the suburban neighborhood in maryland where they lived and now Steve and Kim had the whole weekend to themselves and they were really excited about it okay. because they had this big trip planned. Now, admittedly, Kim had no idea what they were actually going to be doing because Steve was the one who planned it and he was obviously being very secretive about the details. He wanted this to be a surprise. And so for weeks leading up to this weekend, Kim would see Steve on the phone all the time, presumably planning whatever it is they were gonna be doing, but he wouldn't let Kim hear what he was saying on the phone. He would kind of muffle his voice okay. or he'd hang up before she could come over and hear him. And then also after these secret- Yo, muffling, hanging up's a bit weird. Hanging up's a bit weird because like you're just planning something, right? Just going to a different room, you know what I'm saying? Hanging up is a bit, uh, is a bit sus. After phone calls, Kim would often see Steve writing all these notes down in his journal, presumably about whatever it was he was planning. The only detail Steve shared with Kim about this trip was make sure you wear something nice. When the oh! couple reached their car, Steve hopped in the driver's seat yeah, and Kim hopped in the passenger seat. And immediately right after Steve had fired up the car, Kim turned to him and said, are you gonna tell me? You gonna tell me where we're going? But Steve just grinned and said, nope, it's a surprise. Okay. Kim gave a theatrical sigh and sat back and feigned frustration. But inside, the way she was really feeling was just excited. This was so cool that Steve had put so much effort into whatever it is they were gonna do. But also Kim was seeing her husband was really making a big effort to make her happy. And this was kind of new because lately their relationship had been really rocky. Kim and Steve had been married for nine years by this point, and they were both very, very different people. Steve was a total homebody, kind of introverted, and Kim was the opposite. She was super extroverted and very social. But when they first met each other, it was actually their stark differences that brought them together. For Kim, when they met, she was in her early 20s, she had just dropped out of college, and her experience with men so far had been she would meet them at parties or bars, and at first it would seem like their relationship was great, but then invariably these guys would just kind of move on and break Kim's heart. But Steve was different. He was this huge Good guy, guy, six foot four, massive football player, but he was totally a gentle giant. And as soon as he met Kim, Kim could tell this guy is different. He's treating her with respect. You know, he's loyal to her. He really cares about her. And so they hit it off right away. And Kim very quickly became pregnant, at which point Steve asked her to marry him and Kim didn't hesitate for a second. They were totally in love. And marriage to Steve had really been a stabilizing factor in Kim's life. She wound up going back to college and got her degree, which landed her a job as a surgical technician, which is what she did now. And Steve turned out to be just a fantastic father. And he wound up actually staying home with their daughter when she was a baby. All right, yo, so far, yeah, this sounds like a couple paradise. You know what I'm saying? This sounds like a perfect relationship, bro. How on earth is this a murder story? Because obviously it's called murder, summit murder. I forgot, I forgot the other word. There was too many murders. There was too many murders. So Kim could go out and work. And Kim always thought it was funny when she would come home and she would see Steve standing in the doorway cradling this infant, but he's like this massive person. And so their baby looked like a toy. But unfortunately, over the last year, Kim had seen a change in Steve. He went from being a shy person, but a person who could go out and function in society to a shy person who basically stopped going outside altogether. 
Steve basically refused to go out anywhere with Kim. He didn't want to talk to anyone. He didn't want to spend time with their friends or family. He just wanted to stay home and watch TV or nice hang out in the basement. I mean, it was pretty obvious he was depressed, but his introvertedness- Hey, hey, why does that mean you have to be depressed, bro? I don't go outside or do anything. What are you trying to say? Huh? No, I'm offended, bro. I'm offended. I'm offended. We can't just stay indoors. I love staying indoors. I like staying home, you know, watching TV, playing games. Bro, what? Out in the basement. I mean, it was pretty obvious he was depressed, but his introvertedness was becoming kind of stifling for Kim. And so Kim approached Steve and said, you really need to go to therapy to get better here. You know, I'll go with you. We can do couples therapy, but Steve refused. And so finally, right uh -huh. around this past new year, Kim decided she had just had enough. She was totally unhappy. She did not feel like Steve was going to change. No, you didn't, Kim. So Kim told Steve do it. that she wanted to get divorced. And Kim! when Steve heard that, he realized the gravity of this situation. He knew Kim was unhappy with him, but he did not know she was thinking about separating. And so Steve kind of broke down and begged Kim to give him another chance. You know, let him prove to her that he will change, that he wants this marriage to work. And Kim said, okay. so good. And so that was how Steve wound up planning this very secret getaway on Valentine's Day. This trip was supposed to be the start of their new and improved marriage. And so Kim was really excited and optimistic about the future. After driving for about an hour and a half, Steve pulled off the highway and began following signs towards the Eastern Shore, which is a waterfront area of Maryland that's very beautiful, that was located about 70 miles away from Steve and Kim's home. After driving for a few minutes, Steve pulled into the parking lot of the Harbortown Golf Resort. And as soon as he pulled into a spot and turned off the car, he clapped his hands and turned to Kim and said, okay, we're here. And Kim looked from her husband. Imagine Kim turns around and go, this is shit. <laughs> I'm breaking up again 2.0. Bye-bye. Out to all the perfectly manicured grounds of the beautiful resort, and she smiled and leapt out of the car. Oh, excitedly. she likes it. Kim and Steve took each other's hands and marched inside to check in. And as they were checking in, the person behind the desk gave them glasses of champagne. And then after handing Kim and Steve their key cards, the receptionist told them that their cottage where they were staying was like the nicest property at the resort. Okay. Kim and Steve were That's totally good. pumped. They took their champagne and their room keys. They walked back to their car and then drove a little ways deeper into the resort to their cottage it was cottage 506 and it looked out over the water and when they went inside kim was totally wowed it was this rustic suite with a wood fire stove in the middle and two queen size beds and okay she's liking the look of this this picture to me right now is screaming horror story if, if you show me this picture and went you're staying here next week i'm saying fuck no no i ain't i ain't staying anywhere near that Probably looks better in person. Probably, probably looks better in color. And a little coffee table area for breakfast over here. It was perfect. And then when Kim actually walked into this cottage, she noticed there was a card sitting on a table and it looked like a wedding invitation. Kim was confused and looked over at Steve and Steve just smiled and said, go check it out. And so Kim walked over Are and, they she getting remarried? The and she began reading it. And as she did, she began to smile. The card really was a wedding invitation, albeit it was for a fake wedding because it would turn out this was not just a random overnight that Steve had planned for both of them. Instead, he had purchased a romantic getaway package, which included this amazing cottage, but also a professional dinner theater performance that would be held on the resort grounds. Kim read the description of the dinner theater show on this invitation. It was a murder mystery called The Bride Who Cried, where the actors in the show would put on a whole fake wedding, and then at the end of the wedding, somebody would get killed, and the audience would need to figure out who did it. We don't even need to watch anymore. I already know. I already know. I already know. Oh my god, don't tell me this is gonna happen. And that's why there's two murders. Murder party murder. Because he's actually gonna murder her, bro. In the murder mystery game. Yo. For an extrovert like Kim, an activity like this was perfect. And so Kim felt totally touched that clearly Steve had heard her. And the first thing he did to kind of win her back was to begin to do the things that Kim really wanted to do, which was really going out and having fun. 
And so after Kim finished reading the card, she turned and looked over at Steve, and Steve was kind of nervous because he wasn't sure if Kim was gonna like it. And Kim, she broke into this huge smile. She walked over to Steve and gave him a big hug. And Steve, he was so happy, and he hugged her real tight right back. Kim and Steve would spend the next couple of hours sitting by Sounds their fire good. inside of their nice cottage, drinking their champagne and talking about the future and just telling stories and having a good time. And then around 7 p.m., Steve and Kim put on their nicest clothes and walked their way over to the area on the resort where this dinner theater was going to happen. It was in an event hall with a bunch of round tables set up for the audience. And so once Steve and Kim and the other audience members all took their seats, the actors and actresses came into the room and they were all dressed in their wedding clothes. There was a bride and a groom and a wedding party and the audience was instructed to participate in the wedding as if they were wedding guests. Yo, low key, that would actually be fun to do. Like, like not if I actually get murdered, but yo, a murder mystery game like that would be really cool to do. I might go to one. And so the audience all stood up and they began kind of having this fake social hour of meeting all the wedding guests. And then Steve, Kim, and the audience members all took their seats and they got ready to watch the drama unfold. And Kim, pretty much immediately, was totally absorbed in this performance. Yeah, this would be she sick. She was so enthusiastic, talking to the actors and talking to the other guests and really pretending like she was part of the wedding. I mean, she was having a blast. The play itself was about a groom who was in the mafia who was forcing his bride to marry him by threatening her family. The climax came when the groom stood up and gave a toast with his champagne. He took a sip and then fell down dead. Kim watched all of this with delight, but she kept looking over at Steve, hoping he too would be smiling and having a good time. But each time she looked at him, he was just kind of stone-faced and looking straight ahead, like he just didn't care or he was totally disinterested. And then a couple of times when Kim leaned over and said, hey, you know, honey, who do you think did it? Who do you think the killer is? Steve basically just completely ignored her. It was like she wasn't there and the play wasn't there. He was just totally zoned out. Okay. Eventually, Kim and a few other very enthusiastic audience members figured out the killer in the play was the bride's mother who poisoned the groom. And then after this discovery was made, the play was over. As everyone got up from their seats and began to leave, Kim couldn't help but feel really annoyed with Steve because he was just so silent and not invested in this play. And it's like, we came all the way here. Why aren't you at least pretending to enjoy this? But Kim also thought, you know, Steve put a ton of effort into this weekend. He's clearly trying. I'm not going to start a fight. I'm not going to bring it up. But he's not trying, is he? Because he's just stood there like a melon. You know what I'm saying? Bro, this is weird. I, I, I really thought he was going to kill it during the murder mystery. This is now I don't know what to expect. And so finally, Kim just said to Steve, hey, you know, why don't we go to the bar and get a couple of drinks, bring them back to our cottage and just hang out there for the night. And when Steve heard this, he actually smiled and said, OK, great, let's do it. And by the time the couple got back to the front door of cottage 506, they were holding hands again and laughing and telling stories and they went inside and Steve put the beers down on the table and then Kim said she was going to go in the bedroom and just quickly change into something more comfortable. And so Kim walked into the bedroom and shut the door and Steve walked to the front door and turned the lock. Okay. The way you said that was weird, but that's, hey, not, that's not normally a weird thing. Like normally you do lock the door, you know what I'm saying? But the way he said it is like, it's game time, bro. It, it, it's murder time. If you've not heard by now, last week we made a straight year and it's murder time, isn't it, chat? Three hours later, a man named Philip. Oh, is that what he was saying? Oh, is that why he emphasized putting on the lock? Something more comfortable, as in, wear nothing and they're gonna fuck. Oh, is that what it means? Ah, uh, okay, okay. Parker, who was staying at the resort with his family, heard a commotion in the lobby, and he heard people saying there might be a fire at Cottage 506, and there could be somebody still inside. Philip immediately turned to his cousin who was with him and the two of them bolted outside and just started running towards cottage 506. And as soon as they got to a place where they could see the cottage from a distance, Wait, they could this. see black oily smoke pouring out of the windows. When they got up to the burning cottage, Philip ran to the front door, but it was locked. He couldn't get inside. He screamed to see if anybody was in there, but there was no answer. And so Philip and the cousin ran around to the back of the cottage where there was a glass sliding door and Philip, he tried to hand 
handle, but it was locked. At this point, the cousin said he was going to run back to the resort and get a fire extinguisher. And after the cousin ran off, Philip turned back towards the sliding glass door and realized it actually opened on both ends. And he had only checked one side and found that side to be locked. But on the other side, which he was now noticing, it was obviously unlocked because it was open just barely. And so Philip immediately opened it up and all the smoke began coming out. And so Philip dropped down to get a better look because down low, the smoke had not fully settled. There was a bit of an air pocket right at the bottom of the floor. And so Philip got down and he looked inside and for a second he couldn't quite see anything but then he noticed in the middle of the bedroom right inside this cottage he could clearly see somebody's feet somebody was on the ground oh, shit. and so philip screamed that he was coming in and then he opened the door the rest of the way and he began low crawling into the bedroom and as he did he was hacking and coughing from all the smoke and so finally philip reached this person and he grabbed their foot and he shook them to try to wake them up but they weren't moving. But the fire was getting bigger and stronger. The smoke was getting thicker. Philip was really starting to panic and was worried that he too would get trapped in here. And so he just grabbed this person's leg. Yo, are you guys as good as Philip, bro? Like, I think if I was working at a resort and there was a cottage on fire that bad, are you going in or not? Like, you're going to be risking your life. You're going to be risking your own life. You're going in. But you could die. You would. You could die though. You know what I'm saying? You could die. Oh, I don't know, chat. Does that make me bad? I don't know, bro. I told you guys. Like, when I'm in situations like that, it's every man for themselves. Like, you could die though. I'll do the right thing and I'll try and help. To be honest, is this run to say nah? You'd feel bad if you if you didn't try. True. I don't know, but you could genuinely die from that, bro. Like you could be running into your death. And began pulling them. And it was really hard, but he finally got this person back to the door. He couldn't quite get them over that lip of where the sliding door was. Philip's a good but guy. Right then, Philip's cousin showed up, and the two of them were able to grab this person and get them out of the cottage. And this was the good moment guy, Philip. when Philip finally got a look at the person he was just dragging out. And it was immediately clear to him that this person was deceased. Oh, Their shit. face was basically gone. It was completely burned away. In the days and weeks leading up to this weekend, Steve really was taking secret phone calls and writing notes down in his journal because he was planning something very special. But he was not the only one with plans for this weekend. Here's what police say happened after Kim and Steve got back to their cottage following the show and Kim went into the bedroom to change and Steve went to the front door and locked it. A couple of minutes later, Kim came out of the bedroom wearing something sexy. And she oh. looked at Steve and smiled and said, come on, get in bed. Oh. I'll call you in a second. And so Steve's like, great, my plan is working. We're going to reconnect here. He climbed in bed and he laid down. And Kim, she walked over and got something out of her bag. And then she walked back over to the bed and she pulled out a syringe and she stabbed it into Steve before he could do anything. And she injected him with something called succinylcholine. Kim had access to this drug from her job as a surgical tech. Succinylcholine is used to relax people's muscles during surgery. But if you give someone too big a dose, it can stop their breathing. And wait, 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 now I'm confused. I did see this one coming. Why would Kim kill Steve? I, I thought for certain she was the one dead. And she's going to do it in sexy underwear as well? Oh, come on. Come on, talk about the worst way to die. You think you're going to fuck? And you just die. Oh, God. Oh, what the fuck? Why? Why would she kill him? Like, like, bro, I can kind of understand Steve killing. Because she broke up with him. But, like, she's got no reason to kill him. She's just killing him to kill him. Ah. And this drug works pretty much instantly, which means Steve would have seen his wife stab him with that syringe, but then instantly he would have been totally paralyzed 
but fully awake and fully alive. And oh, so as no. he was laying there, he would have seen his wife put the syringe down and then grabbed lighter fluid and then walked over to him and calmly poured the lighter fluid all over Steve's face and chest. They have a kid and together. And one of Steve's final images he likely saw before his lungs stopped working and he died was his wife striking a match and lighting this, him on fire. This After is lighting fucked. Steve on this fire, is Tim casually walked out the backsliding door. She shut it, leaving it open just a crack. And then she made her way to the resort lobby where she put on this big act about how her cottage was on fire and she thinks her husband was still inside. And Philip- Wait, wait, is she still in the sexy underwear? Uh, run topic. Ignore I said that. Ignore I said that. About how her cottage was on fire and she thinks her husband was still inside. And Philip overheard Kim say that her husband might be inside the cottage, which is when he and his cousin jumped into action. They ran to the cottage and Yo, ultimately that's found fault. Steve deceased inside of the cottage. Ultimately, Kim never intended to give Steve a second chance in their marriage. She was already having an affair with a much younger man who was in the Marines, and she was just done with Steve. And so as so Steve kill him. began telling his friends and family how he was gonna make a huge effort to save his marriage, Kim was going around to her friends and literally openly talking about how she wanted to murder her husband but nobody took her seriously. They thought she was just kind of venting and being kind of dramatic. But as soon as the news broke that Steve had died in this fire and Kim had not, people rushed to the police to tell them, pretty sure Kim had something to do with this. Kim was convicted of her husband's murder and she was sentenced to life in prison. It would turn out the primary reason why Steve was so secretive before going on this trip was he really wanted it to be this unbelievably special, romantic, kind of like recreation of the couple's first date. Oh and so my what he God. was doing is he was calling all of Kim's friends and family members and asking them questions about things Kim liked because he wanted to incorporate all of her interests in this trip. Oh, I feel so bad. I really thought he was gonna kill her. Honestly, I'm, so, I'm, I'm baffled. I'm baffled. I'm baffled. And why did what? Why didn't one of the friends say, "Oh, hey, buddy, I know you're doing this, but she wants to kill you, bro"? Why did one of the friends said that? I'm telling you right now, bro. Like, if someone called me up and was like, "Oh, planning this trip for blah blah blah," and they told me they want to kill you, I'm gonna be like, "Yo, just heads up, they want to kill you." Like, bro, what the fuck? And oh, and she's having an affair, by the way. Just in case you didn't know, bro, what the fuck? And then after these calls, when Steve was writing in his journal, that was not just writing down like logistics of the trip. He was also writing down how much he loved Kim and how excited he was for their future and what they would build together as a family. Yo, and that's Steve mad. really believed they were on a path to reconciliation. But of course, that just was not the case. Why was Steve being weird at the murder mystery play though? Why was he being weird? Yo, she's fucking crazy, bro. She's crazy. This past week, we dropped a brand. I'm actually shocked. I I really thought this is this is honestly the first time I've been wrong about being a detective. Maybe I should let the FBI know that I need to resign.